Hello, everyone. My name is Evie Martin. I'm the lead pastor here at Platwoods Church. Thank you for joining us for worship online. My grandfather grew up on a farm in Kansas, not too far from here. He had farm chores. He tended to livestock. He did hard manual work, even as a child. He knew how to kill the chickens when it was time for them to become dinner. As a kid, I remember being fascinated by my Grandpa Martin's hands, rough and storied from over 90 years of hard work and good use. This was my grandfather, my dad's dad, just two generations from me. If I were to set foot on a farm today, I wouldn't have the foggiest idea what to do about anything. I couldn't grow an ear of corn to save my life. Cattle and hogs and the like are highly suspicious of me and I of them. I have a mug with the John Deere logo on it, and this is the extent of my farm life proficiency. My other grandfather, my mom's dad, grew up in Melrose Park, Chicago in the 1920s. His first language was Italian, not English. He was one of six kids, and by age seven, he was selling newspapers to bring home money for the family, and he was riding the Chicago streetcar home by himself after dark. Ask me how much Italian I speak, and I will basically just name several different types of pasta for you. And while I was the editor of my college newspaper for two years, don't ask me to try to sell you one. Just two generations removed from my grandfather's, 60 years, give or take. And life is so very different. Not just my life, but life in the world at large. Surely you could tell a similar story. For those of you even a generation or two older than me, think about your grandparents, how they traveled, what clothes they wore, what they did for work, how they received information and communication. My life is so very different from my grandfather's. And yet, in my four decades thus far, I have lived in places all around the world, but somehow have wound up here in Kansas City, an hour's drive from Grandpa Martin's childhood home. And oh, did I mention Grandpa Manoia became a pastor? In the words of a favorite poet of mine, and yet they are in us, these people long since passed away as a disposition, as a load weighing on our destinies, as a murmur in the blood and as a gesture that rises up out of the depth of time. We come into our lineage by happenstance. We don't choose it. It doesn't really choose us. But the generations before us shape who we are. They are our backstory, for better and for worse. We can't choose the story we step into, but we can choose how we step in and where the story goes after us. This Advent season, our series, is From Generation to Generation. Taking words from Mary's song in Luke chapter 1, we are finding our place in the stories of the generations behind us, not just in our own family tree, but in our spiritual one. The cosmic moment, the event of Jesus entering into our world, born to a young, poor couple in Bethlehem, isn't just a story that's preserved for us in writings and songs. It is the story embodied and believed by every generation between us and Mary and Joseph. Yes, we've been told the story, but more powerful than that, we've been shaped by millions before us who have lived the story over and over again. We step into that line by happenstance, but we do get to choose how we step in. How does this story take over our lives? And how will we live it for generations yet to come? Today we get to learn from Mary, the mother of Jesus, something of what it looks like to step into a long line of generations with courage and with hope. 
When we get to Advent every year, we rehearse the same stories from the same characters. We read the same passages of scripture over and over. And tradition for hundreds of years places two texts together for us today on this second Sunday of Advent. One from the Gospel of Luke to tell Mary's story and one from the prophet Isaiah to remind us of the bigger story she's stepping into. So to begin, we'll go to Luke chapter one to hear about Mary. When Elizabeth, that's Mary's older cousin, was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. When the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, Don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever and there will be no end to his kingdom. These particular details that Gabriel gives here are important. What does the angelic announcer do? He doesn't just say, hey, you're going to have a baby in a really weird way. Are you up for it? (laughs) No, he invokes her lineage. He revives the stories that have long preceded Mary, stories that she knows. Every Hebrew child knew them. He invokes the names of David and Jacob from the past, and then he implies the unending future kingdom stretching out ahead of this not yet agreed to child king. Gabriel, in two sentences, is naming Mary's location in the story of God with humanity. She's right smack dab in the middle of it, and he invites her to lean in. She's got questions, though. Then Mary said to the angel, How will this happen, since I haven't had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come over you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one who is to be born will be holy. He will be called God's Son. Look, even in her old age, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. This woman who was labeled unable to conceive is now six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible for God. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me, just as you have said. Then the angel left her. Mary steps in to her part in God's story. The generations before her had brought it to her. And now here's an angel of God inviting her to play her part. The next verses that follow in the chapter are Mary singing a song to her cousin Elizabeth, who she goes to visit, about how God's mercy and goodness will be carried forth through her for generations to come. So what exactly is it that she is stepping into? It has been pointed out before that the angel greets Mary with the instruction, don't be afraid. Angels seem to say this every time they show up in the Bible. And I don't know about you, but usually when someone tells me preemptively, don't be afraid, it's a really good indication that there is absolutely something I should be afraid of. Maybe a better intro for the angels who come to announce big things to humans would be, don't let your fear say no for you. But here's a really important, scary, and honestly kind of dangerous thing the Lord would like for you to do. But obviously the angels did not ask for my opinion. But what would Mary have to fear? What might have kept her from saying yes to the angel's commission? A young woman already betrothed to Joseph, turning up inexplicably pregnant. She could easily have been dumped, turned out, disowned, scorned, possibly even killed. If a woman has a baby that came from God, can she have other children later? No one knew these things at this point. She had to be curious. What would her family look like now? Probably not what she had envisioned up to this point. A child with the name Son of the Most High 
was not going to live a life unnoticed by the powers of the Roman Empire. Mary obviously knew that, no matter how young she was. Any human baby born to return to the throne of David would have a difficult life in the modern world of Caesar. He would not be welcomed with open arms. Mary knew there was much to be afraid of. She may not have known the specific details of her life and Jesus' life that was to come, but she knew enough of her people's story to know that it wouldn't all be unicorns and rainbows. She had plenty of reason to fear, not because she knew exactly what would happen, but because she knew generally. Is it ever the case that we step back out of fear? precisely because we do not know exactly what is going to happen, but we know, broadly speaking, that things may be dangerous or difficult? You know that leaving a comfortable, familiar job for a different kind of work that God is nudging you into doesn't make sense. It's scary. You stay where you are. You know that ending toxic patterns in a relationship that is keeping you from the spiritual life you want will be painful. It may break beyond repair, so you don't change anything. You know that speaking out against something you know is wrong will cost you. You don't know how much, so you say nothing. You know that letting go of the successful life you envisioned, a life with resources, with family, with security, to follow an unseen plan that God has for you to love your neighbor as yourself might cost you all of those dreams. And that's frightening. So you step back. Mary didn't step back. Mary stepped in. She stepped in because she knew the story that was behind her. She knew there would be a cost, but she was holding on to the gift of generations, a vision of the future that was deeply embedded in her past. What is it that Mary already knows? What is this future vision she has already inherited from the past? The prophet Isaiah is where we turn. In chapter 11, he begins with what is left of a tree. A shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse. A branch will sprout from his roots. Anyone remember who Jesse is? He was David's dad, as in King David. David was the king above all kings, the best of the best in Israelite memory. It's his new throne that the angel said Mary's baby would be given, remember? And Jesse was his dad. But what's the image that we start with here? A stump. There's just a stump of Jesse left. And some roots mangled in the ground. That's not terribly compelling. It's kind of depressing. My mind goes to a landscape of deforestation, places that I've seen in Colorado and Southern Africa, pictures I've seen of the Amazon rainforest, thousands of trees hewed down to clear the land, raw and jagged stumps punctuating the starkness of the ground. Life cut down for profit, for progress. Either way, the image invokes sadness. A stump tells the story that something traumatic has happened to life in this place. A tree is a sign of life, a thing of beauty and shade and protection and fruit. A stump is the absence of all those things, a sign of hope cut down. The stump of Jesse signals a story of trauma of violence to the people of Israel. Any number of historical events could be cited for what that might be. But the prophet begins to weave a new story out of whatever desolation his hearers are feeling, whatever desolation we are feeling. Isaiah signals a shoot, a small, bright sprig bursting forth from the stump of Jesse. There's a new vision 
about to grow out of the tattered world they find around them. It's first a vision of righteous and just leadership for the world. Leadership that is born out of the kind of strength God gives. And then it's a vision of community, a community set right with one another, where the needy will be cared for, and those who suffer will no longer be beaten down. Those who have acted in violence will be put in their place, and those who are utterly wicked will be no more. And then finally, it's a vision of the whole natural world ordered in peace. The words peaceable kingdom have described this part of Isaiah's vision as it's depicted in art throughout the ages. The wolf will live with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion will feed together and a little child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together and a lion will eat straw like an ox. A nursing child will play over the snake's hold. Toddlers will reach right over the serpent's den. They won't harm or destroy anywhere on my holy mountain. The earth will surely be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, just as the water covers the sea. Lambs and wolves lions and cows, toddlers and cobras. These are not the pairings of the world the way it is. I have a distinct memory of my son, Ezekiel, at age two. We were out for a lovely afternoon walk at Lake Springfield. He had toddled on ahead and I was holding back to take a cute picture of him. Immediately after this picture was taken, he turned around to keep walking and then I saw him stop and I heard his little voice say, what's that, mama? He stooped down to grab something moving in the grass before I could even register what was happening. I saw his chubby little hand lift a wriggling black snake that I swear was 17 feet long and just as thick as his little leg and someone nearby, it wasn't me, screamed like I've never heard a human scream before. Zeke dropped the snake, more startled by the scream than anything, and it slithered off into the tall grass, surely traumatized just as much as the mother who clearly could not handle herself in this situation. Because children and snakes are not supposed to play together. Everyone knows this. It's not the order of the world and it's dangerous. Granted, that particular snake probably wasn't, but cobras and vipers like the ones in Isaiah are. And yet, there's the vision that even the animals, the creatures, the ones that are supposed to bite or be bitten will cease their violence toward each other and eat and rest together. On all my holy mountain, God says, they will not hurt or destroy one another. There is a future There is a reality in which violence comes to an end. All of it. Violence in the geopolitical structures of the world. Violence in our communities, in our streets, in our nightclubs, in our schools, in our grocery stores. Violence against people of color. Violence against trans people, against women. Violence over resources. Violence in our families. Violence in our words. Violence against our planet. They will not harm or destroy anymore, period. This is the word of the Lord. This is ridiculous. It's unimaginable. It is impossible to believe. Only the naive and deluded could hitch their wagons to such a star, to such a vision of what will one day be. It's a good thing the people of God have never been asked to believe the unbelievable. Guess who did? Mary did. Mary believed this impossible vision because she knew she wasn't the first. 
Mary stepped into a line of generations of people with the foolishness and the faithfulness to believe this vision of a world where people no longer hurt and destroy. This Advent season at home, my boys and I are assembling something called a Jesse tree. Maybe you've heard of it. But like an advent calendar, each day has a new ornament for the tree that tells a different part of the story. But this isn't just the Christmas story, and there's no chocolate or Legos or wine involved. It's the whole story, all the way from the beginning. It recounts day by day all the people, the generations who stepped into the story of God's vision for the world because they believed it could one day be. It's the story of the shoot from the stump of Jesse that carried us all the way to Jesus and holds out the vision of hope that still lights the way ahead of us. Mary is on that tree because she saw a vision that came from her distant generational past, projected onto an uncertain future. She was afraid, of course she was afraid, But because there was already a story, a vision of a world ordered by right relationships and equity for the poor and peace between the unpeaceable, she could count the cost and step into that vision with a yes. It was worth it for those who were yet to come. For you and for me, for our grandparents, for our grandchildren, for all of us who will one day experience the fullness of Jesus' restoration, God's holy earth, where we will not harm or destroy anymore. It is not popular to step into that story. It is risky to believe in such a future. It can be dangerous to tell other people it is possible, especially those who benefit from the world being the way that it is. And it is scary to speak up and proclaim a world without violence, even more so to try to bring it about little by little. But it's the vision of God that came before us and goes after us. It's the way of Jesus that Mary's yes allowed us to see. There are generations yet to come who need a hope of a world where there is no war in Europe in South America, in Africa, in Southeast Asia. They need a hope of a world without racism and sexism and homophobia and fear of the other. They need a hope of a world where there will be enough water for their families and fish yet in the ocean. They need a hope of a world where the violence and torture of a cross is turned into a sign of selfless, all-encompassing love. This is the story that is already in us from generation to generation. This is the vision for us from generation to generation. Like Mary, it may cost us to have the courage to step into it and live it out. But will you live it for those who are yet to come? Will you pray with me? God of our past, our present, and our future. Sometimes we look around and all we can see are stumps. Trauma arrests our lives. Violence reverberates around our world. Life seems cut down at so many points. And yet, here we sit with the dim light of Advent breaking over us once again. We are people who are here because we long for a different story, the story you give us, the story you gave to our ancestors, the story you embodied in Jesus. Rekindle the flame of hope for your beautiful world, your peaceable kingdom. Give us courage today amidst our fears and our misgivings to step into your vision, to proclaim it and live it for the generations yet to come. In the name of Jesus, our past, our present, and our future. Amen.